want to have a conversation between Ken Wirtz, Executive Director of Mass Facilities Administrators Association, and Jelaine Mitchell, a risk management rep from Maya. Um, Jelaine's having a slight bit of technical difficulty now, um, but she'll be joining us shortly. Uh, Marianne Marina will be handling the technical aspects of the presentation. If you have any technical questions, please type them to her in the chat box. We also asked, um, since there's a number of topics we want to cover today, um, Jelaine and Ken will move through the material. If you could write in any questions on the chat box, and then we'll have time at the end of the presentation to address them. Um, as you guys know, we're all living through challenging times, and it's often really difficult to identify something positive that comes out of these experiences. But I think one thing we at Maya are particularly realizing, and hopefully your municipalities and your employees and your residents are realizing, is really how important the job is of facilities management. I think this has really critically come to light and hopefully you guys are receiving the, you know, the appropriate thanks and um, accommodations just like first responders because you are really critical to this process. And what we hope to see is just continue to commitment to your efforts in terms of budgetary process and um, any other support you can get. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for all your efforts. And with that, I'd like to just give you a brief introduction on Ken. I'm sure the 146 people on this call probably all know Ken, but I'm gonna just give you a, um, a brief outline of his background. Ken Wirtz is the Executive Director for the Mass Facilities Administrators Association, a community of more than 170 facility directors that provide services for municipal and public K-12 schools in Mass. Through the sharing of knowledge and resources, members are able to improve the performance, pardon me, and extend the life of our public facilities. Members take great pride in providing a safe, healthy, and sustainable learning environment for the staff and students who use the buildings that they maintain. Um, Ken now has been doing a lot of work with uh, Mass School Building Authority, the MSBA, on the designer selection panel. But more recently, he's been the facilities representative with the DESE Working Group in regard to reopening. Um, as many of you know, um, prior to coming on board, Ken served as Director of Maintenance and Operation for Sharon Public Schools for 17 years. So um, with that, he didn't want me to say much about him, but um, I'll move over to Jelaine. Jelaine joined Maya Member Services in 2014. She has over 14 years of experience in loss control and risk management. Jelaine is responsible for providing loss control services for all lines of coverage. She evaluates and assesses exposures, safety and health programs, and loss control programs. She excels in producing loss analysis trends, which result in the determination of recommendations for improvement. Um, Jelaine is particularly active with members in regards to facilities management, and she's brought a lot of questions forward. So, Elaine, might that be you joining us? That's me. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Perfect timing. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Ken and Jelaine. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lynn, for that very, very nice opening statements, and uh, I appreciate you keeping it brief because I'd rather get into the content and not hear a um, continually introduction for myself here. Um, so thanks, everyone, for logging in. Uh, I saw a lot of friends in the login group. I do appreciate that. Saw some uh, surprising people joining us today, and I will torment you uh, through the conversation and through the presentation, so just hold tight for that. Uh, again, um, Ken Wirtz, why is my slide not advancing now? There we go. Um, and I'd just like to thank Maya for the opportunity for uh, MFA to partner yet again with them on this to support communities throughout Massachusetts. It's really been an amazing partnership and an amazing journey uh, that Lynn and I have shared over the past three to four years. And, and hopefully we'll be able to connect with some people today and reduce some of that anxiety that everyone is having regarding the opening of schools, the opening of town buildings, police stations, fire stations during these very uncertain times. Um, what I'm gonna do is, Jelaine, I'll control the page from here. Um, and my hopes were to have this more 
like a podcast and then a death by PowerPoint. Uh, everyone is so used to the virtual environment now. I just thought it would be better for us to have a conversation and to talk and really make sure that we're hitting some of the, some of the hot buttons that I'm seeing around the state, some of the information I'm seeing from our members uh, and some of the information I'm even seeing from our local community where I live. Uh, I have two kids that are gonna be attending Canton High School this year. Uh, one's a senior, one's a freshman. So I'm on the parent end of that, of figuring out, you know, what are they doing for cleaning? What are we doing for, are we going back with a hybrid? Are we not going back with a hybrid? Um, so I'm getting it first person on my end as well, in addition to the MFA stuff. So Jelaine, do you wanna start with the conversation? Um, so thank, yes, thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, this, can, you, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, other, I'd really like to just delve into all the information that we have um, and as you post your questions, we'll try and answer them at the latter part of the um, chat or podcast. So if you would um, just type in your questions as we go, and then towards the end, I'll give um, Ken some time to answer those questions. Oh, you want to, no, no, no. You want to... So go ahead, Ken. No, no, no. Okay, so um, this is all based on questions and uh, concerns that had presented to both Maya and both for the MFAA. So what we tried to do is we tried to call out some of the largest problems or, or, or I prefer saying opportunities for us to problem solve versus making it a negative of things that we're seeing across the state. Um, first big one that we're getting a ton of questions about is the thermal plastic you know, barriers and guards, um, plexiglass with one S is the trademark name, but everyone knows it is plexiglass. It's that clear plastic uh, material that people are putting up in front of cashier registers or putting up in front of bank tellers and putting up everywhere. Um, CDC, uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, Governor Baker's office, World Health Organization, everyone is on board with this being one of the tools in your toolbox to help combat the spread of COVID. So you're seeing a lot of recommendations and I'm sure everyone that's in the schools industry, you're being overwhelmed with the amount of vendors that are emailing you about all these cool guards they have for your desks and for your classrooms and for your buses. Something I really wanted to make sure people remember, this falls under building code and fire code. So while everyone uh, on the planet is recommending this as a best practice, you need to keep in mind that there are some restrictions and some guidance that you need to talk with your local building official and fire department. Um, I'm fortunate enough, I, I think I saw his name log in here. Ed Walsh is, is my local building official and I always call him with all sorts of weird and crazy questions. So I'm glad he's logged in today. But those are the people you need to partner with in your communities. Those are the people who are your code officials. Um, so if you're gonna install something on a desk, in walls, in classrooms, they're part of your team to help you make sure that you're not inadvertently creating another hazardous condition by trying to solve the spread of COVID. And that goes to a lot of these recommendations. Um, it's really a team approach. It's really a village that's gonna, that's gonna help us get through this, this pandemic. You need to have them on board with your decisions, with your plans, be part of the solution uh, versus being caught off guard when you think you're doing the right thing and they come in and say, you're not in compliance with building code, tear it out. Um, so get them on your side, go have a cup of a virtual, you know, socially distant cup of coffee with them and let them know uh, which directions you're gonna be going from there. Cleaning products and equipment, uh, that's been a hot button since we shut down our buildings back in March. Um, I just wanna review with people that cleaning versus disinfecting versus sanitizing, those are all different processes. You'll hear a lot of them interchanged uh, just because it's, it's funny, you know, uh, my, my fellow colleagues and facilities directors, we just sit back and think, geez, it took a pandemic for people to realize 
how much we actually do behind the curtains and behind, you know, behind the, behind the, um, behind the black cloud of what is facilities management. We've been doing this forever. Um, disinfectants don't clean very well and cleaners don't disinfect. And sanitizers fall under a different category. Um, so you need to know the process that everyone's out there using all sorts of cool new equipment and everything, spraying, disinfecting everywhere, but you really should be cleaning the surface first, mechanically removing any oils, any food particles, anything that's on the surface to help the disinfectant do its job better. Um, some things to consider, make sure you're not cross-contaminating. You don't use the same cloth to wipe down 25 desks. You, you, you have to use a different cloth or there's processes that, uh, that you can follow where you fold the cloth in eight, eight portions and you use one portion per desk. Uh, you fold it in half, fold it in half again and you rotate it. Um, the reason I use the term sanitizing is because now you're seeing a lot of plans that school departments are having their students eat lunch at their desks. Well, now you've changed that desk surface from something that needed to be disinfected to something that needed to be sanitized with a food grade sanitizer. Preferably something that doesn't need to be rinsed. We've been doing this in your cafeterias forever, but now we're changing what the surface type is in your classrooms to something that might come in contact with food. So when you're looking at products out there, you need to read the label. You need to make sure what you're doing makes sense. And there are safer solutions out there. Um, the EPA has a, a, a DFE uh, recognition, which is designed for the environment. And there's a bunch of products that are listed and you need to make sure they're listed on the EPA's list N as a certified disinfectant for COVID. Um, I've been looking and working with multiple suppliers with the Department of Public Health, with Turi Labs, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute to try and find a greener product that meets all those criteria. Uh, the criteria of is DFE certified, is a natural based product, doesn't require PPE, doesn't require gloves, a mask, a goggles or anything. So a teacher or students could in theory use it. Has the kill time for both a food grade sanitizer, which is three minutes or a disinfectant, which is five minutes. And the big thing, readily accessible because what we're seeing is there's a shortfall in products that are out there. Um, Betco has GE Fightback, which is on FAC 85, the state contract. Um, and I keep looking there. I, I just received an email this morning that there may be another supplier out there that has a similar citric acid based product that carries the same type of value to it. Uh, and the reason I'm looking for these kind of products is as everyone knows, we're using more disinfectant and more sanitizer than we ever have in the history of public schools. We are spraying everything, um, which is not a good thing. We're overwhelming our, our buildings, we're overwhelming our finishes, and pretty soon we're gonna be overwhelming our occupants. So anytime we can look as part of our solution to help reduce some of the concerns and some of the health concerns that come along with products we're using, that's an opportunity for us that we shouldn't be passing up. Uh, reason I list bleach, there's a lot of misinformation and, and misunderstanding of what bleach can and can't do. Bleach is a disinfectant. It's also very corrosive. It's also not very good for people to be using or for people to be coming in contact with. The bigger thing is bleach has a shelf life of about 24 hours. So when you see the CDC or you see World Health Organization recommending a, a one to nine bleach mixture for disinfecting surfaces, keep in mind when you, when you crack open that seal on that bottle, the clock starts ticking. So you can only use that product for 24 hours. After that, its efficacy starts to drop. And after probably three days, you're basically wiping down surfaces with smelly water. So it, in addition to all the health concerns with bleach and all the issues of making sure it's the right concentration, it's the right dilution, you know, is it still viable? I, both myself and some of my other, other greener, you know, uh, colleagues out there in the cleaning industry, would prefer you stare away from it. I know it's easy. I know it's cheap. I know it's readily accessible, but at what cost? So something to consider when you're looking at dwell time. Um, everyone's learning more about disinfectants now. If you grab that tub of disinfectant wipes from your kitchen that we all have at home, I suggest you spin 
the label and read what's on the back of it. Likely you're supposed to wear gloves, you're supposed to wear goggles, potentially an apron. But the bigger thing on the back of that bottle or the back of that container shows you how long the surface has to stay wet. It has to stay damp in order to kill the virus. Anywhere from three to 10 minutes. So by wiping down a surface with a disinfectant and, and wiping it off immediately and, and having it dry within the first minute, you're essentially accomplishing nothing because the virus is still able to live if it doesn't have the proper amount of dwell time. And every product out there, depending on which product you're using, has its own dwell time. So it's really important for you as the buyer and the purchaser and the person who's applying these products to make sure you understand what you're purchasing and the limitations and expectations of what that product can deliver. And then you need to train your custodians and train your staff the same process. Um, we'll get into equipment. And if anyone chimes in with a question, we'll, we'll hop on. I was hoping for this to be a conversation less than a, you know, just me just spitting out information of everything that we've tracked along here. So please chime in. Ken, I want, this is Jelaine. I just want to mention someone um, did chime in and, and suggested Tory and Green Seal and others to have a subset list N that are safer to use. Absolutely. So that's a good point. That's a, that's a great point. Green Seal just released just today, it seems, um, some guidance for, for greener and safer. And in a slide coming up, I do have a link to Turi Lab for all of their school support. Um, but those are both great partners in trying to find safer solutions for us to help fight this, fight this pandemic. So thank you, Jillian. Uh, sorry, Jelaine, I keep saying it wrong. <laughs> uh, electrostatic sprayers, foggers, and other. If anyone was trying to buy one back in March or April, you know the shortfall on availability. Folks that had them, that had purchased them prior, were all set. The ones that hadn't and didn't realize they were a thing, there was a, you know, potentially a three to six month lead time. I'm hearing there's some more that are becoming available through different suppliers, Home Depot, uh, some of your contract um, uh, cleaning supply companies that are on state contract, they're still tough to get. So if you haven't bought them yet, put a purchase order in so that way you're in the queue for getting them when they do arrive. Um, there's a, several different types of electrostatic sprayers. Victory is one. Um, Protexus is another. They all do kind of a similar process where they are creating an electrostatic charge in the, the small droplets that are coming out of the machine. And by doing that, that droplet uh, sticks to whatever surface it, it's being targeted at, meaning that you're not only disinfecting the top of the desk, it actually wraps around and gets the underside of the desk. Again, clean the surface first, then spray. Um, little tricks, little things that come along with training of these, of these pieces of equipment versus walking into it as you're spraying and applying, you should be walking out of the room. You know, you're not going on a hot date to, to a, 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 a club somewhere where you spray your cologne four times in the air and walk through it to get that waft across you, you know, to make you smell sexy. This is disinfectant. This is serious stuff. You should be wearing your PPE as the manufacturer describes, as the product describes, and as you're applying it, walk away from the mist and work your way back out of the space. It's little simple steps and little nuances like that that can change how safe our, our folks are that, are that are the frontliners that are applying these products. Um, and that comes through training and that comes through it, through communication, setting expectations of what your staff is supposed to be doing. Um, I will get into substitute custodians in a little bit, but these are things that whatever product you're using, you need to know how you're supposed to be using it, the safe way, the safe application, what products you can be putting into it. Because not all disinfectants that are on EPA's uh, list N are designed to be used in a fogger or, or an electrostatic sprayer. Foggers um, create ultra low volume droplets. Uh, it, it, it does what it's called, it's a fogger. Um, EPA uh, has sent out information on it as opposed, uh, in addition to Green Seal, that they don't recommend foggers as much as they do electrostatic sprayers. Um, they have some concerns with the aerosolization of the product you're putting on and the person that's applying it. They don't think that, that they're as effective because it's only hitting the surface. It's not hitting, it's not wrapping the entire surface. Um, so if you have foggers and that's what you're using, that's okay. 
you know, we're all trying to do the best we can with what we have, but just make sure you're reading all the, all the manufacturer's recommendations on how to utilize it, how not to utilize it, uh, what products you can and can't put into it. And now we'll get into all the folks that haven't been able to get sprayers or foggers. You know, it, it, I've heard stories of people going to Home Depot and buying the ortho hand pump weed sprayers. You know, I, I was out recently with, with my family and we were at an out, out, outside destination and I saw the, the staff there disinfecting with a Wagner power painter. I mean, these are, good Lord, no, just no, just don't do it. Um, the weed sprayers aren't designed to apply the right amount of, of sanitizers and disinfectants. So what you're doing is you're overusing product. You're damaging the surfaces of your building. You're putting too much product on surfaces. So now when someone comes, if someone comes and sits at a desk, now there's a layer of that disinfectant that's still lingering there. So you're gonna have issues with your, with your skin. You know, you're gonna have issues with the person that's using it, slip and fall hazards, so wiping Ken, away. Yeah. This is a good question that came up. Can other people be in the room while you're using these? Sprayers? So the electrostatic sprayers and foggers, they recommend that the space should be unoccupied. So if you're gonna, if you have to go in and triage the space and people are in there, spray it on a cloth and wipe the surface. So that way you're not putting it into, into the atmosphere. But if you're using a fogger or an electrostatic sprayer, it's preferred that you do it if the space is unoccupied. And this includes door handles, this mister? If the door is closed and the kids are in the classroom and you're spraying the outside of the door handle, I think you're okay because that's not really a closed kind of space and I wouldn't, I wouldn't deem that occupied. Keep in mind that when you're spraying and wiping these things down, you need that dwell time, right? So if, if you're gonna go and disinfect a doorknob while class is in session, it needs to be able to stay wet for five minutes or, or whatever, you know, whatever the dwell time is for the product that you're using. Um, so, Green Seal and EPA both recommend using them in unoccupied spaces. So if you're going in to disinfect a classroom, all the desk surfaces and everything, the space should be unoccupied. Do you think um, that principals and superintendents have the same information as the facilities groups? The same information's available, um, but it's not really their wheelhouse, nor should it be. Exactly. No, they're, so they're, they're, what I'm saying is then the facilities should be uh, managing this and, and also um, training principals, superintendents, teachers in, the right, in their process and how it has to work correctly and efficiently and effectively. Yeah, and that should be part of your planning session. Um, everyone that's at the table planning for the reopening should be communicating with each other what they're doing, what part of the plan is, you know, times when they're going to, you know, schedules on when they're going to be disinfecting classrooms, when they're going to be, you know, doing deep cleans, all that, all that type of information should be part of the district's plan. And for facilities that aren't schools, town halls, police stations, fire stations, all those, all those same principles apply. You really need to be communicating with everyone what you're doing. Otherwise, all you're going to be doing is creating additional anxiety that's not needed. Um, educate people, put postings up on your website, let people know what your procedures and protocols are, let people know what you can and can't do. Um, because unfortunately, there's a lot of can't do's out there of things that we can't do um, based on the age of the building, based on the staffing, based on you know, limitations of HVAC equipment, which we'll get into later. But put that in your communication and let people know uh, what your approach is, what products you're using, and, uh, and, and I think that's going to help alleviate at least all the committees I've been, you know, all the groups I've been talking to, that seems to be a common thread, communication, 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 let people know. I think the other, uh, just to close the loop on this, is um, bringing in your own products from your house. I think that that should not be done. Um, I know students will be, possibly be bringing their own hand sanitizer, and, and we frown upon that. Is that correct, Ken? We frown upon that quite a bit. I think frown is using a really light term. Um, I, I clicked up to the slide. We're going to talk about it. So what's happening now is, and you're going to see it, and we've always fought this. We've always fought this battle. School departments are required to um, have uh, 
safety data sheets on every chemical product that we bring into the building. That lets us know the toxicity of it, uh, how we're supposed to respond, if someone gets it in their eye, or if someone ingests it, whatever, whatever goes along with that chemical, we have to keep a record of it. If teachers, parents, and students are bringing in their own products, we can't do that. We, we, you know, and, and, and the other concern is their product might not work well with one of our products, meaning that it's a dissimilar chemical. So while their disinfectant you know, wipe might contain bleach, we might be using some other thing that contains ammonia, which is gonna create mustard gas. So there are, are legitimate concerns when we're doing this. I, I realize they're doing it to try and help, um, but there are some limitations as to what we should be doing. Best practice is honestly for the school department to provide the cleaning materials to teachers and staff. So that way we have a full record as to what people have in the building. Um, the fire department knows what we have in the building and we, we know how to respond to it if there is a spill or, or if someone, you know, if someone comes in contact with it, that's not supposed to. Um, so that is a really big thing and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Ken, can I just bring in one point here? And we're sure. seeing across the reopening for municipalities. It's really important that the critical information is incorporated in the communication, like both you and Julaine said. So everybody needs to know what the expectation of them is as a resident, as a student, as a parent. So, um, you know, that's one thing Maya is looking to do is, is, is help formulate some of that. But the, we've seen some wonderful reopening plans from um, municipalities that do address these procedural issues. Thanks, Lynn. Um, there was a question or a lot of questions actually about high touch points and uh, frequency of cleaning. How often should you be doing it? And this is where that Turi uh, uh, Toxic Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell has really good guidance and they have a lot of really great resources up on their webpage um, as far as posters, you know, for classrooms on how students should be washing their hands checklists on what you should be doing, uh, recommendations for what are high touch surfaces and how to properly clean and disinfect them. I would say you need to, before we dive into high touch points and frequency and all that, we kind of need to step back a little bit. And you need to have already hopefully started or, or, or at least know that this is something you need to do. You need to evaluate your current custodial plans and operations. How do you normally clean your building during non-pandemic times? You really need to have a thorough understanding and assessment of what your capacity is, what the expectations are from your team, frequency of tasks um, as a good starting point. Because what's going to happen is with all the increased workload that's being placed upon us from CDC, from, from DEFC, in order for us to properly disinfect our buildings, something's going to have to give. We're not magically getting more staff. That's not, that's not happening. I'm hearing some districts are hiring more custodians, which is great. But some things that, that have always been nice to have on our list might have to be looked at under the lens of have to have. It's nice that we spot mop every classroom every night. Is that a have to have during COVID? especially where if we're going with a hybrid model, we're only seeing 50% of the people coming into the space. So you need to evaluate each and every item to figure out how we're gonna be able to workload that building to make sure we're hitting all those critical points. Um, custodial workloading is an industry standard that we use. Each task has time associated with it. You know, if, you, if you're gonna go in and clean a classroom, it's 12 minutes to get in sweep the classroom, fix the desks, you know, wipe things down and get out under normal conditions. Um, ISSA, which is the uh, International Sanitary Supply Association and APA, which is the Association of Higher Ed Facility Officers, both have standards that we use. Uh, and those are good guidelines for districts to get in there and figure out, all right, what can we do? What can't we do? And once we establish this plan, communicate it out to people. Um, it, it, it's 
it's really important that people understand what we're doing. Like Lynn had mentioned, the expectations of timing, of frequency. You know, have you created a map in your building for your custodial staff that shows all the high touch points? Like you're going to be here at 945. You're going to be here at 1045. The kids go to recess at 1145. You're going to be here. Have you broken out to that level? That way you can be continually hitting those high touch points and touch surfaces while still making sure that the occupants are safe. So that way you're not using equipment that's not designed to be used in an occupied space. Um, so it takes a lot of planning and it takes, it takes a lot of time, but it's really, really critical that we're doing it. Um, and again, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, green, uh, uh, green Cleaning um, Institute has some, Turi has some, uh, Green Seal has some. There's, there's several out there. Uh, if you go to massfacilities.com, we do have a COVID page that anyone can access. We have some resource documents and useful links up there as it relates to facilities specific. Uh, example, we'll have MAFMA, which is the Mass Association of Facilities Maintenance um, Directors. They handle all state buildings and state colleges. Well, they have guidance on opening those facilities. While they all don't correlate over to public schools necessarily, there is some valuable guidance in there as to what they're doing in state buildings that can also apply to town buildings and municipal buildings and public K-12. So there's a lot of information out there, but you really need a deep dive into your custodial practices and train your custodians and educate the population that's coming into your building and let them know what they're doing. So is this a good time then to discuss um, designating certain storage rooms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so part of, part of the guidance was to do a full assessment of your buildings, to have an inventory of all the spaces that are available. You may have some spaces that do not have adequate fresh air makeup. An interior classroom that was converted into an office that has no windows and a piece of baseboard heat. That's not a viable space to occupy, but maybe you could store your PPE in there. Um, storage has become a big concern because uh, when, when you think about it, the guidance is that every classroom in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is going to have an alcohol-based hand sanitizer at 70%. We are ordering pallets of alcohol-based hand sanitizer, which is flammable. So where do you store a pallet of flammable materials? On your loading dock, by your snowblowers, by the secretary's you know, desk up at the front office? These are things you need to consider. Talk to your fire department, figure out what's the best location for you to store chemicals that you commonly don't have in the quantities that we're talking about. Um, so you, you don't wanna block your hallways because they have to be maintained as egress. And as everyone knows, storage is, is at a premium in any public school in Massachusetts. There's never enough. So do we need to clean out some of our attic stock materials that we haven't used in a while to convert that space into storage for some of the cleaning supplies and some of the PPE that's coming in? Maybe. Might be a good time to do some spring cleaning. Um, some of the not other issues- necessarily, not, not necessarily, I just wanna add, um, store those items in a boiler room. That's, that's a no, no. Why is that, is that a bad thing? I'm not an insurance agent, but I'm thinking <laughs> no. that's, that's where we usually store right by the gas tanks and the snow blowers. Come on. It's the best spot. Right. Or up um, against, you know, the sprinkler main. We don't and, want and, that. And, 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 and from a facility standpoint, again, we've known about this forever. Um, when we have shipments delivered to us, we don't store dissimilar materials together. We separate them. Um, so it's time to educate everyone else as to what we're doing and where it can be stored, where it can't be stored. Uh, some of the things we're seeing now when you're planning and mapping these things out is substitutions in product. Products is at an all time low for availability. I'm talking to suppliers that sometimes will order two trailers full of product to, to get to their customers and we'll receive two pallets of product to divvy out. There's just not enough to go around to everyone. So what's happening is we're substituting, you know, you ordered product A, I have product B, which is kind of similar, and I have it in stock, do you want it? Absolutely. Well, if you're getting product B, that means you need to re-educate your staff. 
you need to look at, do I need to store this someplace differently? Because it, it, it may look, seem and smell like product A, but you need to be educated on how it's properly stored, how it's properly used. Does it have a shelf life? You know, what can't you mix it with? Um, and like we talked about before, products from home, uh, you know, it's having kids, we always get that teacher's wish list at the beginning of the school year, what your kids should bring into school. I can only imagine that everyone's teacher's wish list this year is going to be disinfectant wipes. Disinfectant wipes, and, and I'm the first to admit, my kids use them without wearing gloves. Uh, they're not designed for that. They're not designed to be used without proper protective equipment. They're just not. But during this pandemic, I think that we've put some of those precautions aside in the interest of making sure we don't come down with COVID. Um, so those are things you need to keep, keep in mind. Uh, PPE, storage, make sure it's someplace that's safe, make sure it's someplace that's dry, make sure you, you, you do a burn rate. How many gloves are you gonna go through in a week? How many masks are you gonna go through in a week? How many are you gonna keep in inventory for the next 60 days, 90 days, for however long you think? Um, being that storage is a premium, the last thing we wanna do is have pallets of face masks in our hallways blocking egress. So you really have to look at that. Um, where are you storing your HVAC filters? Right now, filters are a five week lead time because the material isn't, isn't in stock, it's not on the shelf. We used to be able to order it and have same day delivery. That's gone, that's not a thing anymore. So if you're ordering filters, where are you storing those? Are they in a dry location? Are you putting them in a storage container outside that has a leaky roof? And by the time you go get them, they're all filled with mold. Um, so these are the things you need to consider as well when you're looking at purchasing and stockpiling materials that you are gonna need as part of your response, but just make sure you're thinking it through the whole way. Jillian, do you wanna jump into training requirements? Since we're talking about filters, um, I found our conversation earlier about proper filter usage with certain systems. Could you just touch on that before training? Sure. Um, so ASHRAE, here, let me, I'll go to it. Um, ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, they set the standards and guidelines for fresh air design for buildings. They also provide oversight and support when something like this comes up. They do have guidance on reopening schools and universities, and I'm sure everyone's read in the paper or everyone has at least heard at one time. Everyone's recommending to put in MERV 13 filters. The MERV rating tells you how efficient the filter media is of picking up a certain level of particle of a certain micron. The problem we have with MERV 13 filters are that there's a huge pressure differential drop across the filter media. It's like trying to suck through a garden hose that the other end is closed up. What'll happen is with all of our, I'll use Univent heaters as an example. So Univent heaters for everyone that's been, that it's attended school in Massachusetts at one point in time, is that big noisy air box that's on the outside wall of your, of your classroom, right? Air blows out of it, we don't know where it comes from. Um, those units are designed to have a filter in them, but the filter really can't exceed a MERV 7. Otherwise what happens is we overload the motors and you're gonna have mechanical failure, right? So what you need to do is figure out, okay, we can't have MERV 13, so what can we do in this space? Well, you're gonna to need to adjust the dampers inside because each of those units has dampers inside that regulates fresh air makeup versus recirced air makeup. They're designed to balance it all out to give you a stable temperature by mixing both and keeping your CO2 levels down. With a COVID response, we wanna bring in as much fresh air as we can. That means you need to get in there and either mechanically or digitally through the controls package in your building, adjust those dampers to only be, be bringing in as much fresh air as possible. There are concerns that come along with that. Um, it's not bad right now, but once we get into the winter months, you need to be cautious that you're not freezing up your coils because they're designed to take in some of that tempered air, right? Uh, additionally, if you're reducing the amount of mixed air, and only bringing in fresh air, to balance things out in the winter, you may have to run your heat and open your windows. There's no two way around it. 
So with, with the filtering of those things, th that's something that you need to take into consideration. The other big thing about filters, and, I, and I'll use this chance to talk about this, your technicians that are doing maintenance on these filters, it's not like we've done it in years past. Typically, we'd go through the building, we'd have a, 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 whether a cart or a barrel or something, we'd go in a classroom, we'd vac it out, put the dirty filter on top of the cart, wheel to the next current classroom, do the same thing, throw the dirty filter on top of the other dirty filter, and then we wheel them through the entire building. No big deal, they're not releasing a lot of dust, but now your filter media is potentially contaminated with COVID. That means your work practices and procedures for changing those filters, your, your custodians or your maintenance techs need to be wearing PPE. You should be wearing a mask. You should be wearing potentially an apron. You know, spray down the filter media with disinfectant and let it dwell for three minutes before you remove it from the, from the, from the device. Put that dirty filter inside of a plastic bag before you haul off to the next space. So there are different steps and different procedures now for those filters that we're changing out. And we're changing them out We'll be changing them out more frequently as well. So make sure you adjust your operating budget to handle that. Because now that's, if we're, yeah. That's a good point because you have to share that information um, when it comes to with, with school business administration. You, 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 they have to budget for that. And they have to know that, that it's an extreme process that, you have to, that you're, you're adjusting the whole team to. Right. It's, and it's not only the filter media and the labor that goes away with changing filters. You need to remember that we are running our motors 24-7, 365 now. We're trying to generate as much fresh air in this space as, as, we, as we ever have. Typically, we can go into unoccupied mode where the fans can, you know, reduce or shut off at night. Well, now, you know, the week before school, we're running everything 24-7. We're running it two hours before, one hour after. We're trying to get as much air flushing through the building as possible. Add on to the fact that we're not mixing the air again, that tempered air, we're not mixing it as much. So now you're using more gas, more oil, more electricity to drive all the fresh air requirements that we're having. So in addition to your filter budget going up and your labor going up, your utilities are going to go up. You know, if you're running, I was talking to a facilities director the other day that one of his elementary schools was built in the 50s and hasn't been upgraded since. They have steam radiators and operable windows. That's their heating system. They don't have filters. So what's he going to have to do? You know, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to put fans in the windows and run those fans in winter when they have the heat blasting through the building to try and keep it a comfortable, safe temperature. Or they have to look at a different, op different option for a building. Not all buildings are built the same. So it's really important that people are kind of doing a full evaluation of their building and letting their business managers know that this is, this is gonna cost more. So there was a question that came up um, with regards to HVAC. Uh, mm -hmm. Does the direction of the airflow come into effect? If the ventilation is on one side of the room, it would be drawing the air from one end to the other. Is this safe? And, and the other question was, is it, which is better to have the windows open or the AC on? So that's two questions. Well, the, they're both loaded questions. Um, can I just answer it with depends? Can I just yes. leave it at that? Yeah, it just yep. depends. Um, ideally, the air would flow from one side to the other to an exhaust register above like the teacher's area. You know, historically, the old format of teaching, the teacher does most of the talking, the kids do most of the sitting. That's not how we teach kids anymore. Or, or, or well, let me rephrase that. That isn't how we taught kids as a best practice for the past 10 or 15 years. But that's shifting back to the traditional sage on the stage, you know, everyone face forward, listen to the teacher. Um, so ideally, you would have fresh air supply coming in one side, exhausting the other. It depends on your building type. So if your building is a state-of-the-art facility that needs lead or chips or a, high, you know, a, a highly performing building, it's designed to take these things into consideration. It has MERV 13 filters on the roof. You can adjust all those things with controls. So if you start opening windows and putting fans in, you may inadvertently make situations worse. 
So there's no one size fits all for any building, not even, you know, looking at us geographically, we're so diverse across Massachusetts, but this applies to, you know, your, your municipality, your city, your town specifically. You know, you have, say you have five buildings, all five of them need their own HVAC plan because not all of them are the same. There are very few communities that, that have continuity of systems throughout all of their buildings. Um, so moving air, if it has a purpose and if it's part of your plan, seems to be the best practice. So if you need to increase the amount of fresh air coming into a space and you're going to draw that fresh air from a window, that's okay. If you're putting a fan in a room just to move air around, that wouldn't be recommended. So it's... It, you know, during, during the hot summer months or the, during the shoulder months, if September, if we have a heat spell, I hope we don't. If your fan's in front of a window trying to suck in fresh air and push it across the classroom, that's okay. If the windows are closed and you just have a fan in there to recirculate and make people feel a little bit cooler, that would not be recommended. That's not the intent of, of some of these discussions that are happening. We're trying, to, we're trying to dilute the amount of existing air in the space with fresh air. And that's really the focus of this. And each building is going to be able to do it at different levels. And what is your thoughts on ionizers and HVAC systems, specifically 12 tons? Specifically 12 tons. So like, like bipolar ionization, was that, the, was that what the question was geared towards? Air ion, air ion, it says air ionizers for HVAC systems up to 12 tons. Are they any good? Uh, so, um, where am I? So, um, for people that, that may not know about it, there's a lot of new technologies that are out there now. Um, bipolar ionization is one of them and that gets installed inside your ductwork and it electrically charges the molecules that are coming in from your fresh air supply, creating both positive and negative charge particles then when those get pumped into the classroom or the space, they attach to the virus, suffocate it and have it drop to the floor and you vacuum it up later. That's how they work. Um, timing wise, highly unlikely you'd be able to install them in time for the start of school. Cost wise, a significant investment. Do they work? Yes. Um, the other technology that a lot of people are using is that it's looking at UVC lighting. Um, you know, putting UVC lighting and there's different delivery methods, there's different procedures, there's different ways of accomplishing it. Some put it on, on the inlet side, that's typically designed to help oils and your equipment cleaner, not necessarily focused on occupants. Uh, some folks are returning them on a return air side, so that way your return air that's going into your system has been cleaned, meaning that now you know, trying to have 100% fresh air makeup isn't required because you can mix that air coming back because you've treated it. Um, there are people that are looking at crazy things like ozone generators. Ozone's really horrible. It's good for some purposes. If you have fire damage and you need to go into your space and get rid of that smoke smell, ozone works great in an unoccupied space that is applicated by someone who is trained and knows that they have to keep the space clear for 24 hours. Uh, little ozone generators that are quasi room cleaners, they're asthmogens, uh, ozone attacks, attacks the layer of your lungs. It's really nasty, gnarly stuff. EPA doesn't use it to the point where they say, uh, you know, they, they have a catchphrase like far away, not near kind of thing where they, yeah, ozone in the upper stratosphere to keep out UV, perfect. Ozone generator sitting beside your office desk, not so much. Um, if we could go back to the UV lighting, Ken. Yeah, um, sure. I know, I know we spoke about having um, specific rooms uh, with that lighting, even though it was uh, slightly on the expensive side, it would make more sense. For example, um, the nurse's office or right. the quarantine room. All right. Could you explain? And, uh, uh, I just want to be big talking instead of time and make sure we're not running out of time here, but I will, I will gladly talk about that. And if people want to stick around a little bit longer, I'm happy to, I'm happy to stay as long as we need. Um, so 
There are different applications for UVC lighting. You can install it in your ductwork, like we had discussed. You can also install it in the space itself. They call it UVC up lighting. Um, expensive. It has some caution and concerns associated with it. If the angle of the UVC light gets deflected the wrong direction, it can damage your retina. Um, it can cause a heck of a sunburn. So if you're installing UVC lights, depending on the manufacturer, depending on the fixture, it does come with some concerns and some cautions. Uh, the ones you install in your ductwork typically have a disconnect switch. So that way, if there's a, a mechanic going in to fix the unit, it automatically shuts off the UVC lighting if any door opens up. So there are some precautions and things you need to do. Um, that being said, some isolated areas, it makes sense to look at some different options. They do sell portable UVC fixtures that are designed to go into a space and within 30 minutes kill any, any bug, any virus, anything that's in there. Space has to be unoccupied. You know, have to, so if, if, say you have a, a COVID case where someone tests positive, you can buy a portable unit that you can wheel into that classroom or that office, plug it in, and a half hour later, that, that space has been properly disinfected. So there are some options and opportunities. Um, there are some UVC lighting fixtures and different HEPA filters that make sense to install in your nurse's office. Uh, in, in the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's guidance, portable HEPA filters, little portable air filters and air cleaners that have HEPA filters in them, they're great for those type of areas. For your nurse's office, for your quarantine room, which you need now, um, it's kind of a belt and suspenders approach to just add another layer of potential protection. And while HEPA isn't specifically designed to handle the size of the COVID molecule itself, it is designed to handle the moisture droplet that COVID is transmitted in, meaning the respirable particle that people, you know, exhale, a HEPA filter will capture that. So having it in a nurse's suite by the bed where, where the, the kids come in that potentially are, aren't feeling well makes perfect sense. And that's why the guidance is in there. Uh, realistically and logistically, there's no way we could have enough of those units for every classroom in the Commonwealth. There's just not enough in stock. There, there are too many moving parts to maintain and you would need too many to cover and handle that area, which is why, you know, look at your buildings and figure out what are the most sensitive spaces and are there some one-off portable or even permanently installed technologies that we can use in a smaller application that's going to give us the most bang for our buck, that's going to give us the best return on our investment? We just lost. Um, so one other question in regards to fan um, use of, of de-stratification fans and high ceilings continue to use or disable? That's a great question. Thanks. I don't know. The, I don't. I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, like the like the big ass fans. I don't know. I'm gonna have to get back to back to folks on that. I hadn't I hadn't thought of that one yet. Um, because those are designed just to provide velocity of air moving around to trick your body into feeling it's cold and evaporating moisture from your body. Um, I'll have to look into that. I'll get back. I'll get back to you, Lynn, and you can send out some information to folks on that. Sure. I did want to. If we have two seconds, I did want to hit quick things, um, training requirements, because I know our, our dear friends at DLS have logged in here, um, and uh, Department of Labor Standards. They're the en enforcing agency for OSHA for public employees in the Commonwealth. You need to train your public employees for right to know, which is all your safety data sheets for all the chemicals you're bringing in. You need to train them on bloodborne pathogen, on asbestos, you know, asbestos refresher, OSHA related incidents, and specifically how it relates to their job function and work function during COVID. It's really important. And several of these are annual requirements. So this isn't just a COVID thing. This is just a best practice that you should be doing anyway. Um, and there was a question about substitute custodians. Uh, the same message we've been telling everyone along the way. First of all, talk to your human resources department for your school department, for your town to figure out what the process and protocols and procedures are. You have two options. You can either go with in-house substitutes, which means you build a bench of people that are pre-qualified and pre-screened that you can call them and say, hey, I need you to come to one of my elementary schools. 
That means they have to go through their quarry check, their sorry check, you know, fingerprinted, all that kind of stuff. You also need to train them and, and communicate with them the expectations of what their work function is. No longer do you throw them a set of keys and a map and say, here you go. You need to be very, very clear as to what you're doing, how you're doing it, and why you're doing it. The other option is you can use contract services. There are two contracts in the state contract with OSD. FAC 81 is for contract cleaners, and TRD 04 is cleaning restoration companies. Both provide outside support services for cleaning. Again, you still need to go through that Corey Sorry. You still need to make sure that the people are pre-screened and that those companies have someone on the bench that you can call up at a moment's notice to say, hey, I need two people to come down to my building and here's what I need them to do. Here's what we're doing in our building. And it's gonna cost you a little bit more, but that's what we're facing now because a lot of our cleaners are in that vulnerable population and may not be able to return back to work. There's one other question about um, fans that was just brought up. Um, is it acceptable to use a fan as space utilized for isolation in a school health center? It depends on what the fan is being utilized for. So if the fan is part of their plan to bring in additional fresh air, I would say yes. If the fan is designed just to move air around to keep the occupants cooler, I would say no. In that situation, for the isolation rooms, I would look at some of those portable HEPA, HEPA air cleaners. Not, not the ozone cleaners. Um, there are some air cleaners on the market that actually pump out ozone. Ozone's really, really bad. Um, we've talked about it before um, in this. But be cautious about what you're purchasing as far as those little portable air cleaners because there's a lot of people out there selling a lot of things right now. And not all of them are... are preferred by the EPA or preferred by TURI or, or you know, the uh, Green Seal, um, Department of Public Health, they're, they're really, they could create a real bad situation for you inadvertently. So just be cautious of that. So I would say no on a fan moving air around just for the sake of moving air around. Um, it really should have a purpose. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. If there are any additional questions, you can send them to um, Lynn or myself. Everyone has our email uh, information. Uh, is that correct, Marianne? I believe so. Um, I'll make sure that they have it when I send out the materials. So, Jelaine, what we'll be sending out is um, the, this um, presentation. Um, Ken, and you may want to speak to it, is going to provide a little more in-depth document within the next week that we can provide. Um, and we'll be sending out um, an evaluation. And we really do appreciate your, um, your filling out. We promise it won't be more than five questions. Um, it kind of gives us some guidance as to where we can be going. Um, I really want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, if you think we do need to do a part two of this, if, if Ken's willing, maybe um, we should go ahead and get that scheduled. And we do want to recognize um, the staff at DLS. Everything that they've been doing has been incredible to help towns um, kind of move through this whole COVID and reopening period. So I don't know, Ken and Jelaine, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Well, th thank you everyone for all the hard work that you are doing out there. Um, these are unprecedented times and it takes all of us. It's hard. It's really hard work. And, and, and I, I know that our members are struggling with trying to keep up with everything. And it's just everyone's trying to do the best they can with what we have. And hopefully you picked up something from today. I tried to fit 10 hours of content into about an hour. So uh, I know we kind of bounced around a little bit. Um, but keep sending the questions coming. Anyone that comes up with great solutions or has great strategies, please share them with your colleagues um, because we all need to be looking at this through a different lens to make sure that we're doing what we can. Yes, thank you everyone. Um, I think communication here is key word um, so that we're all on the same page and can work together. Thanks again.